thought of y'all to make good luck this Saturday, bro. What's up, bro? Yeah, what's up, man? 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 Dude, man, what Ricky did was wrong. I know, man, I know, but hey, this kick Saturday, his ass, kick his ass. This Saturday street fight. Hey, man, oh, yeah, dude, man, kick his ass for me. Oh, man. you already kick know, man. Oh, yeah. oh, Where's his zip? His ass, hey, bro. Hey, you know, I got you, man. I got you. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Casey Johnson. I'd like to welcome you to another installment of Powerhouse Personals, the show where I dive deep with your favorite Emerge personalities, ask the questions you've been wanting to ask, and find out the things you've been wanting to know straight from the source. We took a break last month to get ready for fireworks and fisticuffs. Of course, I know each and every one of you heard us on Q-Mix, doing interviews all over the place, getting ready for that. Of course, we thank you for your support there, but it's time to come back, and we are back with a bang. My guest today is easily the most requested guest I've had on this show. It's a man that I've known since 2008, since I was 12 years old. He is a former Emerge Champion, Emerge Outbreak Champion, has twice participated in the Emerge Match of the Year, and he is, quite simply put, the main attraction. Donnie Idol, how you doing, brother? Hey, see. As always, good to see you, man. And at, to add to the list, somebody who I have frankly been through hell and back with oh, yeah. the past few months. Um, so, I'm going to start off and I'm going to hit the ground running, which is a little different from what I normally do on this show. But uh, many of you know and many of you saw, I did a, um, an interview with Donnie right uh, when he was still wearing that lovely neck brace in the middle of Parkside. And uh, that was a few months after his injury. We dove into his personal life. We dove into his love for the business. And we have made sure... Uh, that uh, in our notes for this show we're not going to go over the same thing multiple times. So I'm going to start off kind of where that last interview left off. Um, absolutely go watch that interview. It'll be a perfect companion piece to that. Uh, although a little ironic, some of the things that were said in there. But I'm going to start with a name that we ended the show with last time. Uh, that being TJ Kemp. Um, so... It's the later stages of February, earlier, right, right at the start of March, and we're getting ready for Emerge 30 revelations. And you're the special guest referee for a match uh, between TJ Kemp and Ricky Ruckus. Um, the man who you think might have broken your neck and your best friend in this world. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the circumstances surrounding TJ Kemp's involvement in this entire thing. Uh, TJ Kemp sat two months ago in this chair and I told him to his face, man, we all thought it was you. <laughs> And uh, we all figured out it wasn't. But did you have any inkling that it was TJ? I know we talked, and he was one of a long list of guys that you named off that you had a little unfinished business with. So, I mean, honestly, at first, TJ wasn't the guy that I was looking at. It wasn't the guy I thought it was. Yeah, we've had our differences, you know. Um, and in the past, we went toe-to-toe -to -toe and... You know, um, but he just wasn't the guy. And then more and more people, you yourself included, was like, man, things are kind of lining up. Things are kind of looking like it may be TJ. Of course, seeds planted by yes, one Ricky Ruckus. Exactly. And um, so the more and more people started talking, the more thought I gave it. And the things were adding up. Um, 
so I actually had a talk with CJ, mm -hmm. and he told me from the beginning, it wasn't me, Donnie. You know me. If I have a problem with you, I will address you. Because we've talked a lot about code yeah. and the fact that there are certain lines you do not cross. And especially, looking back on it now, especially as somebody bringing up his son in this business and trying to teach his son the right way to go about things, TJ is just not that guy. Yeah. And after talking to him, I truly believed him when he said it wasn't him. But, but... This is professional wrestling. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. Especially in Emerge. Especially in Emerge wrestling. So, in the back of my mind, there was a little thought. Maybe. What if? It could have been. Um, and honestly, I would have, I would have expected TJ more than Ricky. I think we all would have. Uh, but that brings us beautifully to Emerge 30 Revelations. Um, the semi-main event that, looking back on it, if we had known what was going to go down, may very well have ended the show. Um, you come out, TJ comes out, Ricky comes out. And... I don't think, because Emerge 30 was a really crazy day. It was snowing like all, like all you could imagine outside. Um, the fans were so in tune with this issue that they came out anyway in spades. It was one of the biggest crowds we've ever had at Parkside. In a blizzard. In a blizzard, uh, which of course, that's all you guys. Thank you for that. Um, and all of the players, the, the reason that the show was called Revelation is that all of the players were going to be in the same ring at the same time. We knew something had to happen. Little did we know it would be a coming out party for what we would know then as Red Rum. All of you are in the ring and the lights go out. What runs through your mind? First thing that runs through my mind, Casey, is that, you know, even though myself, Ricky, and TJ, we all had feelings about the other at the moment, and we didn't know who was doing what, behind whose back, and I thought that for that very moment, in that point in time, that the three of us could put our differences aside and defend the territory. Because you figure that that is the definitive moment of, okay, so it's not either of them. Exactly. Something else is happening. So who is it? And the lights come back on. Three men in masks surround the ring. Um, we came to find out those were uh, Chris Morris, Alistair Wilde, Billy Mattern. Um, and I found out at that moment that maybe A.W. Lurch should have run track in high school because he was gone. And a lot of people considered leaving then. I told John to get out. I tried to get out, but I was caught. And uh, as it turns out, that was Alistair. And Alistair wrestles me back to my seat and puts uh, my headphones, puts my headset on me, like making me do commentary over what's about to happen. And that caught your attention, which ended up being the distraction uh, that a certain person needed. Yeah, I mean, well, you're my friend, Casey. We've been friends, as you pointed out, since 2008. Um, if somebody who I know is dangerous has got their hands on you, obviously, yeah, that's going to get my attention. And uh, I've let my guard down just long enough. So, as you turn back around, you see Ricky raise the boot. And I figure for you, this has got to be the moment where time stands still. I mean, it was so quick. But it took forever. Yeah, exactly. Um, I just remember turning. TJ's no longer in sight. Ricky's facing me. Boot coming right at my face. Um, man, I don't even know if there was a thought process at that moment. So then you're on the ground and your best friend is above you looking you in the eye, beating your face in. 
At what point did you actually start to think about what was going on? Well, obviously the moment that he started pounding me in the face. I, I guess my question would be, at what moment did the light bulb go off? What, what was your realization moment of what had actually happened? I mean, it wasn't until after it was done and over with. It was done and it was over with. I was getting helped up. And, like you said, it was like a light bulb. It just, boom, it all came together. And I think if you look at that footage, you can see that light bulb go off. Um, backtracking a little bit, though, did you feel TJ get on top of you? I did. I wasn't really aware of what was going on. Because, um, again, this all happened so quick. Yeah. It seems like it's taking forever. It was really all over happening. in a matter of about two minutes. Yeah. yeah, and it was happening so quick that I remember TJ being on top. I didn't know if they had thrown him on top of me. If I now know that he crawled over top of me. He jumped on the grenade, yeah. And he jumped on the grenade like a real friend would. And um, for that, I'm grateful. So... There have been not that many situations where I haven't been able to talk you down in our entire relationship. Personal, professional. I've experienced about eight or nine of those just in public over the last three or four months. And that first one was after that happened, you grabbed the mic from Chris Lowe, another guy who you've known forever. Um, and we'll get into that relationship a little bit, but we're trying to talk to you and I could see it in your eyes, man. You were gone. Maybe this is a weird way to phrase it, but where were you at in that moment? I mean, you know I'm a pretty level-headed guy most of the time. Uh, a bit hot-headed, but can easily, like you said, be talked down. Um, these last few months, I haven't been the same person. I can attest to that. Um, and that's due to Ricky Ruckus. And, you know, uh, it might be good for me in this no-DQs match, the type of person that I've become. But I assure you, it's very, very bad for Ricky. So I've got to ask you about a week later, um, the first unofficial, I guess, installment of Powerhouse Personals that I did sat right here, talked to Ricky. It feels weird, and I know you can attest to this, it feels weird even calling him by his name, because it's not the same person. Did you, because I know you had, you were trying to get in that whole interview, but when you actually sat down and saw the interview, what was your reaction? <laughs> I just can't believe of how selfish Ricky is. You know, this all started a long time ago. Downtown Throwdown 3. You remember the match. We just passed the one year anniversary of our spot on uh, RTV6. Exactly. And, I was um, watching it the other day like, I can't believe we're here. <laughs> and that tag team match started out as a request of Justin just wanting myself to come and train with him on a weekly basis at DSI. I started doing so, a few weeks went past, I saw his passion and his dedication. It was at that very moment that I knew I needed to have him as my tag team partner. Now Ricky, <laughs> he just comes in the picture and he starts going and training with me and um, he's like, man, he goes, yeah, I want to be a part of this match too. And you know what? That's awesome, because Ricky at that point is my homeboy. You and Ricky have held tag team gold together. Yes, and I would want no other person but him in my corner. But, looking back on it now, I see it was all just a selfish plot. Because, while I was trying to do something good for somebody, 
And for our community, Ricky just had to be there. He had to be a part of it. And um, my thoughts on Ricky is just how selfish he really is. I, f I found it interesting talking to him where he's talking about, you know, not getting interviewed and not being as on camera or whatever. But the whole thing started with you and Justin. It was you he wrote the paper about. It was you he asked to do training. It, it's a logical progression. And every piece, every interview, I mean, he was right there. As well as, I mean, I was. I was there for the whole thing, too. I, that was the moment talking to him where I realized that, you know, he was gone. Yeah. I mean, I think I know Ricky better than anybody. And I know Ricky can come off as a lovable person. And, you know, I know a lot of people. He's a people person. Yeah. The people take to him. I understand it. I get it. I was one of those people, and look how he did me. I just want each and every one of those people who are falsely thinking that he is on some kind of a pedestal and that he would never do them wrong. He did it to his best friend. Scrap the best friend. He did it to his brother. He said he, he told me to my face he would do it to his own family. Speaking of family, his mom, my mom, both going through medical issues right now. The same thing. You think they need this kind of stress on their lives? But he don't care about them, not even our own mothers. He's all about Ricky Ruckus mm -hmm. and Red Rum. And that's very, that's sad. So, the next show, um, Mayhem, um, it's... I don't think it's too far, I, I'm not speaking out of turn, it's fair to say you were out of control. Um, three attempts you made to get your hands on Ricky that night, and Red Rum ends up coming out, there's a suicide dive onto some security, and um, he gets away again. I was just seeing Red that night. The only thing going through my mind that night was getting my hands on Ricky Ruckus. The only thing. Nothing more, nothing less. I just wanted my hands on Ricky Ruckus. Still, just like to this very day. So, after that, Ricky films a video of himself. Uh, right, right across the street from where we are right here at uh, the parking garage and says, meet me here Saturday, we can do this with or without a match. Um, I think I can pinpoint this as the moment where, when what happened happened and the events that transpired that we're about to talk about, I think, just talking to you, I think that's when you started to come back down to reality. Because, man, he played you. I mean, again, I was running on emotions. Yeah. I wasn't thinking. I was running strictly off of emotions. He wanted to fight. He was telling me he wanted to fight. That's all I wanted since this happened, is a fight. I thought I was actually going to get that fight. But again, my he didn't even play me. He kind of played me. I played myself that night. My emotions got the best of me. So, on the way to the show, Cole and Sean get run off the road. <laughs> TJ ends up by himself against one of the most experienced tag teams in the Midwest. Puts up one heck of a fight. Looks like he's about to get the win. Lights go out. All the meanwhile, you're at the parking garage. Now, unbeknownst to you, Red Rum decimated TJ. Um, I, know, I know you've told me your phone started blowing up. What was the moment for you when you kind of realized that he was there and you were there? <laughs> when I was standing in that parking garage all alone, me and a cameraman. I felt like a fool, and not, not much longer than that, 
my phone, like you said, started blowing up. Fans were telling me, Donnie, get here to the show. Ricky is here at Parkside right now. And that's when I came. So, I'm part of a team of about 20 people chasing you all around this building in circles, trying to get the situation under control. And I apologize for that. That was unprofessional. Yeah, nobody makes me run. Um, But you get backstage and you get yourself thrown out of a company you helped start. And I think the per- almost it's weird that I would say a commissioner is a periphery figure in an issue. But Chris Lowe was I think at a point and I've had discussions with him too of where he was fed up with not being able to run his own show and I think you know you've known Chris for so long it's really easy to see him as your friend and not your boss sometimes uh, was that a bit of what happened or you know again I was just the fact that I was seeing red I know, looking back, I know everything that I did was very unprofessional. I've had this conversation with Chris, though. I've apologized. I know that it wouldn't have been tolerated with anybody else, and that I know that when I'm a talent, just like anybody else, that I'm held liable, just like anybody else would be. And I know that I overstepped my boundaries. And I apologize to you, I apologize to Chris, I apologize to the board of directors, um, and I just, uh, again, one of those things where I'm running off of emotion. So, the next month, you finally get an opportunity. You finally get your match, it, unsanctioned as it may be, which maybe you even viewed as an advantage because there were no repercussions for anything that you would do. And you meet with Branham. You sign the paperwork, you're ready for the match, and from behind again. And at this point, you know, it's starting to sound like a broken record. You get attacked, you're running on emotions, all of it. But it's, it really was just everywhere that you turned for a little bit. Casey, I couldn't go nowhere. It wasn't even just the things you, that the people were seeing on camera. It was off camera. And you couldn't even go wrestle at another show without him showing up either. I couldn't go down the street. I couldn't go to the store. I couldn't... Listen, it was bad, Casey. Um, at this point, Ricky's just got me to a point where uh, I'm not thinking clearly at all at that point in time. Not even uh, not even a little bit, you know. Just uh, He's got me so angry and so flustered and just... Uh, I can't eat, I can't sleep, nothing. And you barge into that match. They're right near the end. And uh, as it seems fitting, Red Rum becomes Red Run, and uh, Ricky splits. And even with no rules, you can't get your hands on him. So then, at a meeting of the board of directors, it's decided, hey, we're doing this all over again and there's a cage involved and you know it's weird because there have been it seems like this issue has been a revolving door as far as some of the personnel uh... people have been taken out people have overstepped their boundaries and been fired they have been replaced um... UConn Mike obvious choice to bring onto your team oh yeah um... what was what was it like? Because I figure by the time you got out there, you probably got out to that unsanctioned match before you realized that Wolf was out there. Yeah, I mean, it was a surprise. Um, with the firing of Billy Mattern, we thought we would have the advantage that night. I mean, there's not a whole lot of guys who, or at least we thought, there's not a whole lot of guys who like Ricky. And there's not a whole lot of guys, at least we thought, that didn't approve of his message and the way he was going about things. And then... And then surprise. Morris gets fired for trying to run Mike and his family off the road. Sage Phillips. And 
And I know you were watching the monitor in the back before you went out for that cage match. And I could not believe the... Sage Phillips is like a rabid hyena right now. I don't know what... It's like he's a scavenger. I've never seen that from him before. I'm telling you, Ricky has got mind control over these guys like no other. Everybody knows Sage Phillips. He's a technical wrestler. He likes to out-wrestle you, not jump on your back and bite you. And I, If props can be given anywhere to Ricky, he knows how to talk somebody into his way of thinking. Look, straight up. <laughs> I think Ricky's proved this. He's all bark. And no bite. But, but, the one thing he does got is a mind. Mm -hmm. And he, he uses it well. He gets these guys, he talks to them, brainwashes them. They follow him as if he's their god. And they carry out his dirty work. You gotta give the guy that much. So then finally your music hits. 750 people screaming to the high heavens. You can't get in the cage. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they're blocking the cage door. It's like, you know, attack you, run, hide. Attack you, run, hide. Like, whatever I do, I just can't get to it. No matter what. Yeah. And then, what I fully to b believe to be the most ironic moment in Emerge history, you leap off that cage. Now, let's rewind about two years or so. Emerge 11, the first Emergence Day. You're flying off a cage to save your best friend Ricky. Two years later, you're flying off a cage in order to get to him. I mean, yeah. I mean, let's go back and let's uh, let's rewind history for a minute. Let's go back and look at history. And uh, if you remember right, the only cage match up until Fireworks and Fisticuffs included Ricky Ruckus, a man who couldn't even stand on his own two feet at the end of that match. We wouldn't even be seeing Ricky Ruckus right now if it wasn't for me, the guy who's had his back since day one. So it's kind of bittersweet when you say, yeah, in front of 750 people, I'm diving off a cage to get to Ricky Ruckus. And then you start to beat up on him. Wait for it. He bolts. Imagine that. That so, seems to be his MO. Now we're in a situation where even the cage couldn't contain this issue. So, the only thing that... Hold up, let me stop you right there. So that brings us to Saturday, August 4th, yep. Parkside Elementary. No DQ, Battle of Columbus, Falls County Anywhere Street Fight. Ricky, I've been talking... Casey, sorry, I've been talking to you face to face for a minute. Ricky, <laughs> the time for attacking people, hiding behind security, jumping people again, hiding behind more security, it's done. It's over with. Saturday, August 4th. <laughs> you know those matches you were talking about, those two years of match of the year candidates. Not candidates, but match of the year winners. <laughs> This ain't gonna be no match of the year. This ain't gonna be no wrestling match. Ricky, look me in my eyes when I tell you. <laughs> you better be in for the fight of your life. Because Saturday, <laughs> I'm gonna whip your ass. Nothing more to be said. Donnie Idol, my guest on Powerhouse Personals, I thank you for your time. Of course, we remind you this Saturday, August 4th, Parkside Elementary School. Doors open at 6. Got a Facebook Live match at 6.40. Doors. You want to be there when they open. You don't want to miss that first match. You want to get your best seat. And at 7 o'clock, 
the show, the event of a lifetime, Donnie, officially starts. And in your main event, the battle for Columbus. Falls count anywhere, inside the building or out. Street fight, no rules, no disqualifications, no count outs. Folks, tickets are still on sale. I implore you, I implore you to go Contact Emerge, get your tickets, make sure you're at this event because I got a feeling you are going to see a level of violence that has never been inside of Emerge before. My name is Casey Johnson. We'll see you guys next time.